So you know, APRV ventilation is something that, that is used uh, fairly frequently in our ICU. Uh, certainly not as frequently in some places, but definitely more frequently from where I trained. I never used APRV ventilation in my surgical training. Uh, and then coming here to my fellowship, uh, it was used a little bit more often. So I really wanted to kind of talk a little bit about, um, very quickly, about ventilation, APRV, and it's a little bit less exciting than the OR recess, I understand, but at least we can maybe just kind of get an idea of what it is, because even though we use it a lot in our ICU, and I know more, some of our experienced nurses have used it more often than some of our less experienced nurses, I don't know if how, many, how many people really understand what it is, and I want to kind of go into it um, to make it hopefully less daunting um, as a mode. Well, you guys have seen probably this picture before. This is the iron long. This is kind of the first ventilator that really was used in uh, national. Well, I'm not sure. But it, he looks like someone famous, perhaps, as a patient. But he's obviously not very sick. Uh, but you know, I, I, I look at all these pictures from the 40s and 30s. Everyone has nice, clean-cut hair and everything like that. So who knows what's going on? But you know, this is really, we've come a, a fairly long way from the idea of the iron lung. But the exact principles are still the same, and that is oxygenation and ventilation. That's never going to change in terms of when we're giving artificial uh, ventilation to patients. And in terms of the issues, it's still the same thing. So, you know, if you put a, uh, a jello pudding over some guy's head and says, this is increasing his oxygenation ventilation, uh, you know, I say Mazel Tov, good for you, let's, let's use it. Because as long as we're increasing oxygenation and ventilation, it doesn't really necessarily matter as a concept what we're doing to ventilate these patients. Of course, there are fine things in there, and that, you know, we can talk about uh, very quickly. So oxygenation is simply absorption of lungs. PO2 in the pulmonary capillary bed goes, uh, it collaborates with the PO2 in the, in the alveoli. Depends on good match of pulmonary blood flow and alveoli, we know that. Ventilation is excretion of CO2 direct uh, related to alveolar ventilation. And minute ventilation is total amount of gas exhaled per minute. That's kind of the definition of these things. And that's all it is. It's nothing more. It's nothing less. Those are simple definitions I think that everyone should just kind of keep in mind. And there are all these modes of ventilation that we use. And you know we see it. We write it. And we don't really think about it too much because we kind of take it for granted in some ways. There's just this control. There's continuous mechanical ventilation, which is really the same thing as assist control for all intents and purposes. There's SIMV, or synchronized intermittent mandatory ventilation. There's pressure support. And then there's finally the way that it's described here, mostly because the literature that came out of this institution is TCPIRV, which all it is is pressure control mode ventilation, or time cycled pressure controlled inverse ratio ventilation. And uh, rather than talking about those details, I just want to quickly go through some of these kind of flow things and schematics. I think these are really important because I think this really explains what these modes of ventilation are. Remember, ventilation is simply, or artificial ventilation is simply ventilating and oxygenating. If you can accomplish those two things, you're pretty much good to go. So here what I'm showing you on the very top is the tidal volume. Right here is the flow, and right here is the pressure. So you can see in a, in a CMV mode or an assist control mode, this is CMV. In this, this case, the patient, let's just say, is completely paralyzed and completely sedated. So they will not be breathing on their own at all. So if that's the case, you can see that here we go. We have the actual tidal volume going in and out of the patient, up and down, up and down. Of course, we're pushing that in. So here's the flow. It's being pushed in. And then as we push in air, the pressure inside the actual lungs is going to increase and decrease. That's all it is, this is control. Now, we know that our patients hopefully won't be paralyzed and won't be sedated for very long. So we wake these patients up. And the whole idea of assist control mode is the patients actually breathe themselves and they trigger the ventilator to give them this whole big tidal volume. So even though we set the ventilator 12, it should, if a patient is breathing four over that, they're going to be getting 16 full tidal volumes of breath. Does that make sense to everyone? All right, pretty easy. And I know we do, in, in our IC nurses, you guys do this all the time, but just to review things. Now, SIMV is a little bit different in the sense that SIMV, you can breathe on your own. However, you will not be getting the full tidal volume of breath when you breathe. So here we are. This is the mechanical breath you can see here. Here's the mechanical flow, as you can see here. And here's the pressure, just like in assist control. And you can see that the patient is breathing on their own here. And they're not getting the full tidal volume. What makes SIMV SIMV, that's the synchronous portion, is that when the machine is going to trigger another breath, 
it will hopefully time it with the patient's own breath. So therefore, it'll synchronize with the patient's next breath, which is, let's say, here, the machine senses the patient's about to breathe. Boom, it gives them the whole flow. And there's the pressure increase as well. So that's synchronous intermittent mechanical ventilation versus assist control ventilation. And again, we've seen that quite a bit in the um, ICU. Now, what's pressure support ventilation? Well, pressure support ventilation is absolutely no mechanical breath whatsoever. In other words, the machine will never breathe for the patient. However, the machine will give just a touch bit of the actual pressure in the airway. In this case, our pressure is set at five. You know, we say pressure support of five and a peep of five. In this case, there is pressure support of five. So what's happening is, is that the patient is having that pressure support to overcome the circuit of the machine. So it's kind of like if we were breathing through a straw, it's pretty hard to do that. But if we have a little bit of pressure to help us breathe through that straw, we can do it. So what is APRV? Well, APRV stands for Airway Pressure Release Ventilation. That's what it stands for. And it's not a new thing. It's actually been around as early as 87 when it was first described and used even in the early 80s. And it's just another way of getting oxygen into the lungs. Remember, that's the whole point. That's the only thing that we're trying to do in these patients. However, one thing that's important, I think, to take home from this discussion, it is not a ventilation savior, nor is it a final solution. So if patients are having difficulty on mechanical ventilation, and we're increasing the FiO2, we're increasing the PEEP, we're changing the pressure control ventilation, it's not as if APRV is the final mode before we can give up all hope. That is not the case. In fact, I'm gonna show you a little bit of work why in fact APRV may not be helpful at all. In some patients it very well may be. But it is important to realize it is not a final solution for ventilation. Simple thought in terms of APRV settings. There's the T high, there's the T low, there's the pressure high, and there's the pressure low. And I'll show you exactly what that means on the actual schematic. Unlike CPAP, however, which is it's most closely akin to, the time at high pressures is much longer, and a release valve allows spontaneous breathings at high pressure. And I'll show you that in a, in a cartoon schematic. So here are the proposed benefits of APRV. It's keeping a patient's alveoli recruited with air exchange at high pressures. And I'll show you some pictures of that. The thought is that it prevents alveoli collapse and therefore alveoli injuring. CO2 is released during exhalation, therefore you're not keeping high CO2 levels, though there is in fact one of the problems with your PV is you can get hypercapnia. And supposedly it causes increased patient comfort. So if you look at the alveoli, this is a little sketch of what alveoli may look like. You can see in a positive pressure breath, as you desufflate in other modes of ventilation, if you don't have high pressure in there, you'll have some desufflation of alveoli. And there's some that believe that as the alveoli contract up and down, that actually causes alveolar damage and can lead to other problems. Perhaps ARDS, perhaps increased inflammatory response, perhaps lung injury. The data is still out. We're not exactly sure, but there is some thought behind it, and there may be some truth behind it. Here, in APRV ventilation, the whole idea is you keep the lungs insufflated. You keep the alveoli insufflated for as long as possible, and then you quickly release it, and then it insufflates again. And that long insufflation, as I'll show you in a second, is the whole idea of APRV, that you're increasing the amount of exchange without causing collapse of the LVI over and over again. So this is kind of complex. I just want you to focus on this line right here, OK? What I'm showing you is that alveoli, as you increase pressure in the ventilator, alveoli stay collapsed until it reaches a certain point. Then it opens up. So that's what I'm showing you right here. As we're increasing the pressure in the ventilator, alveoli are collapsed, 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 boom, they open up. And that's the whole idea of giving a patient PEEP. The whole idea of PEEP is to keep the alveoli open in that point of maximal inflection when they'll all of a sudden open up. And this is important because this is the whole concept behind airway pressure release ventilation, CPAP, and PEEP. Is that, remember, alveoli will stay closed for a period of time, even when you're giving air to the patient, and open up only when they reach a certain critical airway pressure. So this is kind of APRV. And it actually came out a little bit better on my computer screen. I apologize if you guys can't see it very well. So this is what it looks like. And I want you to think back to some of the other things, and maybe in the handouts you can look back at all the other kind of assist control, all that kind of stuff, and realize that we have uh, actual breaths that patients are taking, or in fact, in this case, what we're looking at is spontaneous breaths over here. 
And here we have the actual flow of the patient. And I'm going to show you something. This is the T high and this is the T low, okay? So the T high is four and a half seconds. The patient is on a high pressure, which will be next, for four and a half seconds. The patient is on a low pressure for 1.5 seconds. That's T high, that's T low. Now let's look at P high and P low. Here, the patient is on high pressure at 30, 30 centimeters of water. Low pressure is eight centimeters of water, right here. And you go back to T high, they're on that high pressure for four and a half seconds, and on that low pressure for 1.5 seconds. That's all that APRV is. And I'm actually going to show you exactly what's going to happen when we start adjusting the ventilator to make it to CPAP. Now, one other difference. You notice here, we've got spontaneous breaths. That's the real difference between this and setting the ventilator for four and a half seconds and dropping it. The idea is that the valve in these types of ventilators release, therefore you're able to breathe spontaneously on your own at these high pressures. The question is, proponents of APRV believe this is comfortable for the patient. Whether it is or not, I'm not quite sure. I think it's very patient selective, and I'll show you some examples of what patients that may benefit from this. I, I'm just a th I, you know, I'm a simple, trauma surgeons are really simple. We're kind of dumb. We think of simple things. Bleeding, stop the bleeding. Patients in shock, give them fluid, that's all. For me, it's hard to imagine that having 20, 30 millimeter, centimeters of uh, water in my lungs, to breathe on that, to me, seems like it's a little bit difficult. But perhaps in those patients that have acute lung injury, perhaps it is. And that's the whole idea. That's the proponent of ARPRV. They believe that this actually increases patient comfort. So now, once you start weaning down the T high and weaning down the P high, eventually you get to pressure support. Just good old fashioned CPAP. Here we are. Here's your P high. Here's your P low. And you can see there's your pressure support ventilation. Basically, that's what APRV is once you start weaning things down to that level. And what Dr. Doucette's saying is that if I take the ventilator and I put it up to pressure support to 30 for four and a half seconds and drop it down to eight for, five, uh, for one second, and I keep doing that for a day, eventually I'll just, instead of going up to 30, I'll go up to 20. And eventually I'll go up to 10. And eventually I'll go up to five. And look at that, you have five and five. And that's the whole idea of APRV. When you're weaning the APRV ventilator, you can start dropping down your pressure support accordingly. Does this make sense to folks? But that's all it is. It's really not uh, rocket science. Okay. So what? When should it be used? Is it really comfortable? And are there any negatives? Well, there are theoretical advantages, kind of what I was showing you in an earlier slide. Some believe, as I mentioned about the alveolar distension and collapse, that it may be lung protective. Some believe that because you can breathe on your own, remember that when we were at the top of the ventilator, you could breathe on your own at that high pressure? Some believe that it actually decreases the need for sedation and paralytics. There are some that believe that it actually improves hemodynamic profiles, though I don't think that's true, and I'll show you some data to suggest it's not. And originally when it was purported, because of that idea of alveolar collapse and that idea of lung protective, some believe that it's a better ventilation strategy for not only preventing ARDS, but in ARDS. The amount of volume that's going to be moving in and out depends on the actual compliance of the lung. Let me give you an example. If you take um, a balloon and you blow up that balloon with your lungs, imagine the difference of blowing, and you're applying the same amount of pressure into that balloon. Imagine the difference of uh, volume that will happen at the same amount of pressure if your balloon is made of solid steel versus rubber. If it's made of steel, if you apply the same amount of pressure with your lips, the steel balloon will barely blow up in a very non-compliant lung, a lung that's sick with ARDS, so forth and so on. Versus a balloon that's made out of rubber, if you blow the same pressure, you can imagine that rubber balloon will expand a fair amount. So your tidal volume will differ, will differ significantly depending on the compliance of the lung. This mode of ventilation is hoping that your lung isn't so thick and so um, uh, inflamed that it will be somewhat compliant. But your, your tidal volume will actually vary significantly from patient to patient. Therefore, your minute ventilation will vary significantly from patient to patient. There are actually some studies showing that it does have some benefit in the sense that patients can successively be ventilated with this mode of ventilation. In patients that have similar tidal volume set for assist control ventilation, they do have lower peak airway pressures 
similar if not better P to F ratios, and less sedation is needed. But that's very sparse data. And that data isn't set against ventilatory modes that we normally use. It's set against assist control with very high tidal volumes, 800, 900, not necessarily 8 cc's per kilogram that we're generally used to. There is no study that has proven APRV to better than any other mode of ventilation. And furthermore, APRV ventilation, just as any other mode of ventilation, is only as good as the providers. So that's the key. Is it as good? No. And in fact, only the ARDS network trial has shown that a lower tidal volume during assist control can benefit your ADS. What that means is that APRV, TCPV, uh, uh, jet ventilation, uh, oscillatory ventilation, nothing has been proven as of yet to have any benefit with ARDS except for lower tidal volumes in assist control ventilation. Nothing. Now, there is some sparse data here or there. Yeah, yeah, it might help. It works. Yeah, I've shown it. I've published eight patients that have been this way. Some sparse data over here. Yeah, you know, it, it might work. There's some theoretical benefits. But in terms of large, multi-center institutional trials, only one mode of ventilation, assist control and lower tidal volumes, has been shown to have any benefit for mortality, days of the ventilator, and ICU days in ARDS. That's it. The question, therefore, is maybe there are certain patients that would benefit from ARPV. Maybe not the ARDS patients, but other patients. So patients that, that, that do not tolerate low pressure support because of agitation may benefit from APRV. Maybe if we give these patients just a little bit of sedation, give them a little bit more uh, pressure support through modes of APRV ventilation so they can breathe on their own with higher pressures, maybe those patients will benefit. Or patients that need higher pressure support for oxygenation. I mean, think of a lot of our patients in the ICU that, uh, you know, you put them at, uh, they're, they're satting well in assist control, you make them breathe on their own, they start to desat at five. Well, let's put up the pressure support to 10. Yeah, they do pretty well on that, but they look uncomfortable. All right, why don't we try APRV? Let's put them at a, at a P high of 20 for four, for, uh, for four seconds, a P low of one. They can breathe on their own, they'll get the support they need, and maybe that'll help them. So perhaps those patients would benefit from APRV ventilation. Truth is, the jury's still out. We just don't know what's going to happen. This, this is actually an interesting, uh, this, is a, this is an old picture of a courthouse, one of the oldest courthouses in, in the United States in Pennsylvania. And uh, all these jurors are, they're all dead white males now, but nevertheless, that, at the time, this was considered the jury of your peers. Uh, but things have, things have certainly changed.